Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. And we've gathered together for worship. Those that are coming in, I, the ushers have been doing a great job of reminding you if you're taking communion this morning, our little communion cups are in back. And that will be a part of our service this day. Um, just a reminder of a couple of announcements, and one of the big ones is right up here. Somebody asked me about this. We want to say thank you for all the people that gave, that we have one of these units in the AED. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. We've been deciding where to mount it. And I was thinking right on the front of the pulpit might be a good, good place, you know. No, probably not. But we do want to say thank you to everybody that gave toward that. that that's a, a great help to the church. Um, today we want to uh, be in prayer as we have been for our nation. It seems the things that we pray for is enlarging. And so continue to be on your knees uh, praying for our nation in many different ways. I said in the email this morning, we not only pray um, that our nation would recover from the virus, um, but also that we would recognize the virus of sin and, and turn our eyes toward the Savior who is the champion, our champion of defeating sin and to keep our focus on that. And um, so this morning as we've gathered together, um, we'll have communion uh, partway through. I'll explain those little tiny cups that you have. Um, we're thankful that those are available in that shape and form. Um, but let's bow our heads for prayer. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this place and our gathering together. Thank you for those that are watching online. And Lord Jesus, as we've come into your house this day, I pray as I talk to one dear lady that this would be a peaceful place place to gather our, our minds and our focus on you. Lord Jesus, as we um, sing songs uh, to you and about you, as we pray, as we, Lord, uh, open up your word and realize that it is your word spoken and written for us, uh, that we would, we would gather our thoughts on how we are to live our lives in the world that we live in, no matter what that world looks like, you want us to live as Christians, ones who follow after you. And so guide us, Lord, in those times. Lord, this morning, um, I think, too, of, of the ministries and the missionaries of this church. Lord, help us not to be discouraged, either the ministries of this church or the missionaries on the field, not to be discouraged. That The Great Commission is still before us, that we are to go into all the nations and, and make disciples. May we not be discouraged, but keep taking steps forward in that direction. Lord, we, all, we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been, it has been great to uh, go through the life of Christ again. If you didn't know, I've, I've preached through the whole Gospel of Matthew, the whole Gospel of Mark. Now we're in Luke, Luke chapter 23. So I'm almost through that. And uh, hopefully before I finish my ministry at some time, I'll get all the way through John. I, I think it's really important for Christians to, to know the life of Christ, to know what he went through. Um, and to be very uh, familiar with it. And so we're in a part of the passage of Scripture now where Jesus is headed to the cross, and we've been walking with him to the cross, and he's in the trial, the trials of Jesus. And just as a little bit of review, and I like to make charts. I'm always looking for a way to make a chart. So we, we said there's, there's a six-phase trial that Jesus is going through. So this is a little bit of review. The first trials before this man named Annas, he was high priest. Uh, he hated Jesus. He was the one in charge of the marketplace, and Jesus wiped out his marketplace twice. And this was kind of a pre-trial, maybe a grand jury to us. 
It was a time when they were trying to bring charges against Jesus, but they couldn't get any charges to stick. And the big thing was they had no witnesses against him. Then the second trial goes before Caiaphas. He is actually the high priest. He's the son-of-law of Annas. And, and this trial, they, they still didn't have, they had witnesses, but they were all false witnesses. And so the, the, um, the high priest went a different way and said, okay, we're just going to ask him to see if he says he's God. And if he says he's God, then that's blasphemy and he's guilty. We don't need any witnesses or anything. Remember, these trials are happening at night. And they're not supposed to. Trial number three is the whole Sanhedrin. And this one reconvenes at daybreak. And they do this at daybreak because it makes it look like it's a public trial, but it's really a mock trial. It's just a rehashing of what happened all through the night. And, and he stands before them, and they ask him the same questions again, and they don't have any witnesses, and, and boom. And they don't have, they, they take a, they say, what do you say? And everybody says, guilty, kind of thing. And so hopefully last week, if you didn't get that, last week, listen to last week's sermon, because it allows you to see all the injustices that were happening at this time. The fourth trial is what we're going to look at today. The fourth trial is in front of Pilate, the Roman governor, and this is a trial of investigation. It's all about uh, Pilate and his first conversation with Jesus and all the questions and the interaction that's going to happen there. Then it's going to go to a fifth trial. That's going to be next Sunday, and he'll be in front of King Herod. And the main thing that will come out of that trial is Jesus' silence. He's just silent in that one. And then the last trial is the sixth trial. He's back in front of Pilate again, and this is when he'll get his final sentencing, his final sentencing. So that's kind of the lay of the land of where we are and what was happening to Jesus at the time. So we're in Luke chapter 23 and verses 1 through 7. If you have a scripture journal, it's page 162. This is trial number 4, and this is Pilate's investigation, I've titled that. But in your scripture journal, if you want to do this, you can go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 63, and somewhere in the margin, if you want to, you can put end of number 2. And then if you go to Luke 22, 66, you can put in the margin number 3. And so you're starting to list out what trials there are. Then if you go to Luke 23, 1, where we're at right now, in the margin you can put number 4. Then if you get to Luke 23, verse 8, then you can put in the margin number 5. And then Luke 23, verse 13, then you put number 6. And so when you go back to that scripture, you can see when... This trial, this trial, this trial, this trial, as Luke goes through it. Just another helpful hint there. So let's go to verse 1, chapter 23, verse 1. It says, then the whole company, and the whole company means the Sanhedrin, the 71 ruling elders of them, uh, arose and brought him before Pilate. So that makes you stop and ask the question, who was Pilate? Pilate was the Roman governor. He was appointed by Caesar to rule over that region, not just Jerusalem, but the whole region. He ruled from 26 AD to 36 AD. So Jesus is, that's during the time when Jesus is crucified. Um, he's, he's someone who's going to be in a five-way pickle. I've, we've talked about that before, about being in a pickle, and Jesus putting people in a pickle. Well, this guy, once we look at him, we're going to look at him a couple different times. You're going to see he's in a five-way pickle. In one pickle, one side he's got Caesar, his, his boss, who, is, who he's, he, he reports to. And if, there, if there's something that disrupts in that region, who's Caesar going to? He's going to Pilate. The other one is the people. He's got a, on the other side is the people. He's, he, you will see that he kind of caters to the people, whatever the people say. Another one is the Sanhedrin. He's got 71 ruling elders right in front of him telling him what to do. The fourth one is Jesus himself, because Jesus always puts us in a pickle. Every time that you meet up with Jesus, he puts you in a pickle. And so you're going to see that. He's going to put Pilate in a pickle. And then this very last one is who? His wife. <laughs> His wife is on one side. So not to give him any empathy but, but, or sympathy, sympathy but, but just to realize that here's Pilate in a pickle. Now, before we go any farther, because Luke does not, talk about this, I thought it would be good to say, okay, where's Judas? What has happened to Judas? And so we're going to have to go away from Luke to find that. 
So if you go to Matthew chapter 27, if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 27, I want you to just fill this in because Luke doesn't give us what happens to the man who betrayed Jesus. Matthew chapter 27 says, When daybreak came, all the chief priests and the elders and the people plotted against Jesus and put him to death. And after tying him up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And so you can see how that verse, those two verses equal what we just read in Luke 23, 1. Verse 3, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had, he had been condemned, meaning Jesus had been condemned, was full of remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And I'll stop right there because I want you to see what Judas' solution was. Judas' solution was, I'll just give the money back. If I just give the money back, then everything will be okay. But look at who he went to. Did he go to God the Father? Did he go to Jesus? No. Who did he go back to? He went back to the chief priests and scribes, the ones who had done just a tremendous injustice to Jesus. And for some reason, he thinks he can turn this all around because he's in control of the money. Well, it doesn't work out that way. Verse 4 it says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us, they said. See to it yourself. Now, there's a couple things happening here. The first thing is that Judas, <laughs> Judas is repenting. He's feeling bad about what he did. But again, who's he taking that to? He's taking it to the wrong person. The second thing is, is Judas comes in with a true witness. He comes back to the same people that have tried Jesus, and he says, wait a minute, he's innocent. Now, if you were here last week, what should have happened with the trial at that point? If more information came in, it should have what? Should have stopped right there, and they should have looked at the new information. Here actually was a true witness that was there. But how did they respond? No, nah, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need any witnesses. We've got them. We've got them right where we want to. And, and too bad. We used you, but too bad. You just deal with it. So how does Judas respond to that? So he threw the silver into the sanctuary and departed. And, and, and then he went and hanged himself. Now, the word for sanctuary there is the word not for temple, like the whole temple, but it was it's the word for the holy of holies. So I want you to get a picture of what Judas did. Judas went into the court of Gentiles, and that's where the marketplace was. He went, and that's the biggest part of the temple. He went through that, and he went into the court of women. Now, the court of women is where only the Jewish men and women could get in that spot. And they went through the court of women into the court of Israelite men. So now he's in the space where only the Israelite, the Jewish men could be, and then the next section of the temple is where only the priests could be. Only the priests could be in that section. So he went through all those three sections. He got right there, and that's where he threw in the money. Why did he do that? Because who is the only person who could pick up that money now? He tried to give it to them. Only the priests would have to be, were the only ones able to be in that room, and they would have. To pick up that money and they would have to do something with it do you get the sense of his vengeance that's there I want to just step away to say you know sometimes sometimes people do things that are wrong but we never follow it with another wrong my mother used to say when I was a little guy, two wrongs never made a right. And I would go, mm -hmm. but boy, I tell you, I never realized that until I grew up that that is so true. I mean, even in churches, I've been in churches at times when in a meeting or something like that, someone said something the wrong way. And then guess what happened next? Someone else followed suit and said something the wrong way back. And then guess what happened next? Someone else 
said something wrong the wrong way. And they just followed suit. It will never get solved that way. That's the same way in our society today. Something was done wrong. How was it answered back? Was someone else doing wrong? And it will never get to a solution that way until someone stands up and does and says what is right. I hate that when that happens in churches because guess what the pastor has to do? I have to go to each one that said something that was, I'm not a very popular person when that happens. They have to go back, because each time it's what? Wrong. Each time it's wrong, and we have to focus what's right. Well, the, the chief priests and the scribes were wrong in their response to Judas. Judas was wrong also in the way he responded, the way he responded back. So the ending of the story here, 6 through 10, the chief priests took the silver because they're the only ones that can pick it up because of where it was thrown and said it's not lawful for us to put in the temple treasury since it's blood money. So they conferred together and they brought the potter's field with the burial place for foreigners. And therefore that, that field has been called the blood field to this day. So Matthew wrote his gospel about 30 years after Jesus had risen from the grave. So even 30 years later, they're still calling it that. And then it was spoken through by the prophet Jeremiah was filled. Uh, they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him whose price was set by the Israelites, and they gave them to the potter's field as the Lord directed me. I want you to see the hypocrisy that's being revealed here. We'll come back to this over and over again. They didn't keep the law about how they held their trial, but boy, they were sure keeping the law about how they handled this money. They were more concerned about how they handled this money than they handled the individual that just went through the trial. Now, just the last piece about Judas. If you go to Acts chapter 1, we have one more scene where Peter gives us a little more information about him. So Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 16. There's 11 disciples now, and Peter explains that there needs to be 12. And so this is what he says, starting in verse 16. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David spoke in advance about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So Peter looks back in the Psalms and he realizes, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit has already spoken through David in the Psalms about this betrayer and what should happen next. Verse 17, for he was one of our number and allotted a share of the ministry. Remember how I said that when Judas is mentioned, he's always mentioned as one of the 12. And he did stand right alongside of them throughout the ministry. Verse 18, now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages, and he fell head first and burst open in the middle, and all his insides spilled out. And that's true. I mean, he was given 30 pieces of silver as his wages. What happened to those wages? It went to buy this field. Verse 19, this became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that in their own language, that field is called Hekladama. I'm sure I didn't get that quite right, but that is field of blood. So everybody knew this story that I'm reading to you, this history event of what happened to Judas. And then verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it. That's one psalm. That's describing that, yeah, it's a graveyard now. And then the next one, let someone else take his position. And so that's when they went through and they voted and they, Matthias took his place. But I just thought it was good to realize what happened to Judas. What was the rest of the story there for him? So let's go back to our passage. Verse 2, Luke 23. And then they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man, number one, misleading our nation. Number two, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. And number three, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So here are the charges. Now notice these charges are different than the charges that came out of the trial. The charge that came out of the trial was blasphemy. He was saying that he was God. But they knew that wouldn't, that wouldn't go with a beep. Um, 
wouldn't, wouldn't go in front of Pilate. So here's the three, collecting the Jews against Rome. That, that Jesus is someone who is massing up the Jewish nation to do a revolt against Rome. Number two, forbidding taxes to Rome. That, that, that he is telling everybody, do not pay taxes to Rome. And number three, declaring himself a king, declaring himself higher than Caesar. And so they trump up these charges because why? Because they want Pilate to think that Jesus is a threat to Rome. Verse 3, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. You have said so. Now, Jesus, that's a famous phrase that Jesus says. If you go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 70, it says, so they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. <laughs> if you go back to Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus talks to Caiaphas specifically, Caiaphas will ask him, but Jesus kept silent. Then the high priest said to him, by the living God, I place you under oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. In verse 64, he says, you have said it. And Jesus told him, but I tell you in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of the coming of the heavens. So he, he says this phrase over and over again. But now I want you to go to John chapter 18 because here we'll see that conversation in more detail of what Pilate has with Jesus this first time. John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we'll start at verse 28. It says, Then he took Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would have been defiled and unable to eat the Passover. I want to show you the hypocrisy again here. That the Jewish people could not go into a Gentile residence. And so they brought Jesus right to the door but would not go in. Why? Why would they not go in? Because they didn't want to be defiled. Why did they not want to be defiled? Because then they wouldn't be able to eat the food later in the day. So they were willing to break one law, but not another law. Verse 29, then Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? So he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's just asking, he's in, he's in charge. And so he's just asking them, what's, what's the charge? Verse 30, look how they respond. They answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. <laughs> it's like they're saying, we're offended. We're offended that you're even questioning us, that you should know if we're bringing this guy to you, that he's a criminal, and you should just do whatever we tell you to do. We're offended that you even think that, even that you ask the question. Verse 31, the first part of it, so Pilate told him, take him yourself, judge, your, judge him according to your law. So Pilate just gives them permission, go ahead, go ahead, we'll... Uh, we'll we, we'll go differently in this scenario. You, you've got them. You can do whatever you want to do with them. How do they respond? It's not legal for us <laughs> to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. There's the hypocrisy again. See they, see, they would keep Roman law, but they wouldn't keep Jewish law. And so it was that way. Um, the first governor that was governor of that region um, under, under Caesar, uh, had made the decree that only the Romans could do capital punishment. And so the Jews weren't able to do that. So that actually was a law that was in place, but they were willing to keep the law, the Roman law, but not the Jewish law. Verse 32, they said this, so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, signifying what kind of death he was going to die. I'm always amazed, I'm always amazed that God, used, God puts his words in other people's mouths in even what we would consider the enemy. If you keep your finger in John chapter 18, because we'll go back to it, go to John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. Every detail about Jesus is, is, is important. And it says in verse 32, as for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, 
I will draw all people to myself. And he said this to signify what kind of death he was about to die. You see, in the Jewish nation, if someone was to die, it was by stoning. And so what they would do in stoning is they would throw someone down into a pit, and then they would throw stones at them. That's the whole picture. But in the Gentile nation, in the Roman world, what would they do? They would lift someone up on a cross. And so even that detail to show you that God is in control of how all of this is going to happen. Now, back to Romans 18, verse 33. When Pilate went back into the headquarters, he summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So he has this personal question to Jesus, takes him out of the scene. Verse 34, Jesus answered, Are you asking this of your own, or have others told you about me? Jesus is saying to him, Wait a minute, have you really looked, are you really looking at me? Are you really, do you really want to know who I am? Or, or, or not? And again, Jesus lots of times will answer a question with a question. That really plays out here the indifference of Pilate when it says next, then Pilate, then I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? So you can see that Pilate is really indifferent to Jesus. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. He doesn't really even care who Jesus is. Verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that it wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not have its origin here. I tried to think of that refrain, um, refrain back and thinking about a Pilate who's indifferent to Jesus, who doesn't even know who he is, doesn't even really care who he is. And if he would have heard those words from Jesus saying that he's of a kingdom, but his kingdom is not of here, his kingdom is not in action, his kingdom is not of the origin from here, of how he might respond to that, I think, I think he might think, wow, this guy's a little, where, if it's, it's not here, it's not anywhere. And so verse 37, you are a king then, Pilate asked. And there's Jesus' phrase again, you say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Beautiful verse. Why? Because Jesus comes back and he describes how he came. I was born for this, and also why he came. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to save sinners. He came so that those would hear the truth. And those that hear the truth are his true followers. So, what does Pilate say at the end here? What is truth? There's that indifference again. And after he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging this man. He basically says, he's, he's innocent. He's, he's not guilty. And if we go back to our passage of Scripture in verse 4, verse 4 says, Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Verse 5, But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. What happens is they give a repeal. They give a, a rebuttal. They say to the one that's ruling over the land, You're wrong. You're wrong. Verse 6, but you'll see how astute Pilate is here. Because if I read that last part of 5 again, from Galilee even to this place. So what did they let on? Where was Jesus from? Galilee. That's the origin of it. He picks up on that. Verse 6, when Pilate heard this, he asked them whether the man was a Galilean. And then verse 7, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction... He sent him over to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at the time. See, Herod was... Now, who's Herod? Who's Herod? Herod, Antipas, is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was, Herod, was the Herod in charge when Jesus was born. Herod the Great is the one who ordered for all the babies, baby boys two years and younger to be killed so that they was trying to get rid of this one called the, that they claimed to be king of the Jews. That's who Herod the Great is. Herod the Great had three sons. 
And when he died, he divvied up his region to his three sons. And Herod Antipas, the one that we're talking about here, is tetriarch of Galilean Perea uh, in the north. And so when Pilate hears that, wait a minute, Jesus is from Galilee, Herod is over that section, and guess what? Herod's in town. Why is Herod in town? He's in Jerusalem because the Passover is happening at this time. Great timing. Wow, this couldn't have been better. Well, I'll just pass him off on to Herod and let Herod take care of this guy. Now, you're going to have to come back next Sunday to hear about Herod. Okay. But I want to I wanna walk through this one more time in a way just so you can start to see the flow of the story. So verse 1 was the presentation, the presentation of Jesus to Pilate. Verse 2 is the accusation. That was the charges that were brought against Jesus before Pilate. Verse 3 is the interrogation. That's that Pilate is actually questioning Jesus and trying to get more information. Verse 4 is the exoneration. That's when Pilate comes out and says, he's not guilty. I find, no, I, I find nothing wrong here. I find nothing wrong. Exoneration. Verse 5 is the intimidation. That's when all 71 people come back at him and say, no, you're wrong. You need to, he's doing all this stuff. Number 6 is the hesitation. And this is where I, he starts to get in the pickle. The hesitation about what I should do. Wait a minute. I thought I would just come out and say he's not guilty, and they would all walk away. <laughs> but they have not walked away. They're still in front of me. And then verse 7 is the liberation. Now, it's not the liberation of Jesus. <laughs> it's the thought liberation that he was going to have from the scenario and situation as he hands him off to Herod. And as I said before, you'll have to come back next Sunday to hear that one, okay? So let me, this is the last slide. Let's look at these charges that were brought against him. So the first charge is the charge of misleading the nation. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 17. And I'm going to read these words of Jesus, and you ask yourself, is this sound like he's misleading the nation? He's misleading the nation. Starting in verse 17. Don't assume that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Does that sound like he's misleading the nation? Sounds to me like it's, he's leading them back to the Bible. He's leading them back to the law and what the law says. So that one's untrue. Let's look at the second one. Luke chapter 20, and verse 25. This is when Jesus is specifically asked about paying taxes. And that's a, we've went through this passage of Scripture. And when he responds, he responds with that famous thing. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So he says, no, pay taxes to him. Whose image is on there? Is Caesar's image on? Give it back to him. Give it. But then he throws on that last part. And to God, the things that are God's. If we are created in the image of God, then what should we do? We should give ourselves to God. So did he tell them not to pay taxes? No. So that one's, that one's not true. Let's go to the last one, John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. When he gets done feeding the 5,000, I want us to look at the reaction of the crowd to this feeding of the 5,000. So John chapter 6 and verse 15. It says, therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, to make him king, what did Jesus do? Well, he, he said, you know, I wear a 36 long robe and, and a, I like a white stallion. And um, my, my head size is seven and a quarter if you're looking for a crown size kind of thing. No, he didn't do any of that, did he? He, he didn't encourage it at all. 
it says he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So is that one true? No, that one's not true either. So none of the charges were true by the scriptures that are there. So let me finish with these two verses, these two passages in Matthew. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 18 and 19. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples again about what's going to happen. This is before it happens. Actually, verse 17 says, While going to Jerusalem, Jesus took his 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, verse 18, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. True. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the, tri and the scribes. True. And they will condemn him to death. True. And then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. True. And be mocked, flogged, and crucified. True, and we'll have that played out as we continue through. And, praise the Lord, he will be resurrected on the third day. True. Now, I bring that up because what do we see there? Pinpoint accuracy. Does that do anything to you? Does that do anything to you as a Christian that there is such pinpoint accuracy that Jesus, what Jesus says happens? And so just all those prophecies about how he would even be here the first time, Pinpoint accuracy happened. All these things that are happening right now as he's headed toward the cross, pinpoint accuracy happened. So does that, as a Christian, do you, do you stop and you look at what Jesus has said and go, wait a minute, what about his second coming? What about what, about what he says it is to come? What about what he says about everything, about heaven and hell and everything? Do, do I look at that and realize that, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm reading somebody who has pinpoint accuracy, who speaks the truth. We really need to be listening to that, that guy in these days. That's one thing. And the second one is, if you probably flip over a couple pages, Matthew 27. I want to pull one phrase out of the second conversation that Pilate will have with Jesus. In Matthew 27 and verse 22 and this is actually Pilate speaking to the crowd. He, he asked them, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And they all answered, crucify him. But that question, what shall I do? What's that make it sound like Pilate's in charge, doesn't it? What shall I do? But I think that's the same question every person has to ask. What shall I do with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? Last week I said this, you can wrongly judge Jesus, but he will always rightly judge you. So to wrongly judge Jesus is to say he is anything less than the Son of, Man, Son of God. He's le anything less than the Messiah. Anything less than the Savior, anything less than God, you have wrongly judged Jesus. And when you wrongly judge Jesus, scriptures tell us our destination is hell. If you rightly judge Jesus, you make him out to be God. He is God. He is your Savior. He is, he is the one that you were following after, and, and you have committed your life to him, your whole life to him. And according to scripture, destination heaven, destination heaven. But I want to turn that question around. What shall I do with Jesus? Turn it around and take me out of control so much and turn it around and ask the question, what would Jesus do with me? <laughs> what would Jesus do with me? And that really should bring us to our knees. What would Jesus do with me? It should bring us to our knees to say, if I've been resisting Jesus, I need to start repenting. I need to start stop saying, I'm going to do it my way, and start repenting and saying, I want to follow after Jesus. And I realize he's the Lord. He needs to be Lord of my life. And I believe in him, and I confess him as my Lord and Savior. And when that happens, then I'm restored back into God's family. And when I'm restored in God's family, he retools me to send me back out into this broken world to do what? To tell other people about Jesus. 
the one who forgives sins. It should drive us to that. I know, Christina, I keep going back to that, don't I? Your little diagram. But really, I do pray that people would realize that if you're hearing these words this day and your heart's burning within you, you hear about Jesus, your heart's burning within you, if you've been resisting him, to start repenting. And he will, he will take that repentance and he'll turn it into restoration to be able to use you. And so instead of being the people who were standing there and saying, kill him, crucify him, that you would be a person who would say, you know what? I want to live the rest of my life for him. And actually, I would be willing to die for him rather than him be crucified. So let's, let's think on those words this day. I hope as we walk through pretty methodically <laughs> through this time period of Jesus that it, as a Christian you realize how much he went through and what was happening in behind the scenes for what you have in your salvation. Your salvation did not, it wasn't free in that sense. There was a great cost that came so that you could have your salvation, the cost of Christ. So let's bow our heads in prayer. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. And um, Lord Jesus, help us as we, as we walk through these, these trials. Help us to see that every, every move that you made, every word that you said, and even the words that what we would consider the enemy said, actually orchestrated by God to fulfill prophecy so that it, the new covenant could come into place and so that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I pray not only for the Christians who are here this morning, but for anyone who hears the name of Jesus and that, that, that they're not indifferent to him anymore. They realize that he is the king, that he has pinpoint accuracy, that he is the savior, and I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and realize he is the only way of escape, that they would turn to him and be saved. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that there would be people who would be saved because of what you have done on the cross and rising from the grave on the third day. Lord, thank you for what you have done. In thy precious and holy name, amen.